always wanted to be one of the top players in the world for sure. Um, so I understood what it would take for me to maintain my form in all three formats, not just one format. And along, you know, the, my early days in my career as well, there have been a lot of people who have doubted um, the way I've gone about my game. If someone criticizes you, it's, it's better to actually, you know, take the criticism and look into it. If something's wrong, you, you try to correct it rather than just being blunt and just ignoring the world. And um, yeah, I, I looked upon it um, because I was out of the team after that for a while. And um, I sat and I, I analyzed what I did wrong and uh, improved on a lot of things and um, it, was, it was good that I decided to take that criticism and actually um, change the stuff I needed to. It's, it's hard for me to believe sometimes as well that you know, I've, I've uh, got these many uh, centuries in international cricket or one day cricket separately and I just, I just try to forget that moment quickly because I don't want to uh, you know, think about it too much and then start doubting myself thinking that it's come too early for me because I, I um, want to achieve something really big and I want to be you know, known as a player who won a lot of games for India and uh, who scored a lot of runs for the country. So um, I, I get that thought and I let go of it because then I sit down and think all the greats of the game, they start doing that at a very early age. So it's not such a bad thing to start doing that when you're young and uh, you know along the lines you keep learning and you'll have phases but as long as you can stay consistent, I think that's, that's a very good thing. Even now, there are doubters and haters all around. But um, one thing is for sure that I've always believed in myself. I've always believed in my heart that if I work hard 120% every day of my life, I'm non-serable to no one. The first story is about connecting the dots. I dropped out of Reed College after the first six months, but then stayed around as a drop-in for another 18 months or so before I really quit. So why'd I drop out? It started before I was born. My biological mother was a young, unwed graduate student, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates, so everything was all set for me to be adopted at birth by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped out, they decided at the last minute that they really wanted a girl. So my parents, who were on a waiting list, got a call in the middle of the night asking, we've got an unexpected baby boy, do you want him? They said, of course. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the start in my life. And 17 years later, I did go to college. But I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Stanford. And all of my working class parents' savings were being spent on my college tuition. After six months, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all of the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. The minute I dropped out, I could stop taking the required classes that didn't interest me and begin dropping in on the ones that looked far more interesting. It wasn't all romantic. I didn't have a dorm room, so I slept on the floor in friends' rooms. I returned Coke bottles for the five cent deposits to buy food with and I would walk the seven miles across town every Sunday night to get one good meal a week at the Hare Krishna temple. I loved it. And much of what I stumbled into by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Let me give you one example. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every label on every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, 
I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture, and I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me. And we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. If I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on that calligraphy class, and personal computers might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. Because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path. And that will make all the difference. Self-love is when you say to yourself, Ah, oh, man, look, I know you and that girl got a real connection. Um, I know y'all vibe, but that's your girl's cousin. So I love you too much to let you do that. It's like you say to yourself, hey, man, look, I know you want to eat that pizza and it'll be really good, you know, but I can't let you eat that, man, because if, if you eat that pizza, you're going to feel like shit. You know, and I, I just, I love you too much to let you eat that. Self-love is, hey, look, I know you got a, a, a test on Monday, you know, and I know you really want to go out with your friends. It's Saturday night, you want to go out, but if you fail that test, you're not going to feel good about yourself. You know, I just, I love you too much to let you go out tonight. Self-discipline is self-love. If you want to be happy, you have to love yourself, which means you have to discipline your behavior. The road to sustained happiness is through disciplining your behavior. We tend to base our self-esteem on what other people think. And that's not really self-esteem. Self-esteem is supposed to be how we feel about ourselves and I was just saying how dangerous it is to allow other people to determine how you're going to feel about you and it's kind of like looking into a broken mirror you're going to look in a broken mirror and then change your face to try to look good in this defiled busted broken mirror and it's it just other people's opinions is a really way to determine how we feel about ourselves. So in life, you know, there are moments when you stop and ask yourself, how did I get here? Like, why am I standing here? Well, this is definitely one of those moments for me. And I find myself going back to the beginning, back to my roots. I was born to incredible parents, amazing parents who served as doctors in the Indian Army. I was the firstborn, and as far back as I can remember, I made my parents very proud and happy 99% of the time. Okay, slight exaggerations of personal achievements are allowed from time to time, don't you think? <laughs> my brother was born a few years later, and even then, nothing changed for me. 
we were both given equal opportunities and I want to emphasize this, I want to really emphasize this for you because I don't think a lot of people might understand that being equal might seem very normal but where I come from, India and a lot of developing countries around the world, more often than not, this is an exception. It's actually a privilege. My first experience of the glaring disparity between boys and girls came at a very, very young age. I grew up in a middle-class family with extremely philanthropic parents who constantly reminded me and my brother how lucky we were and how giving back to those who were less fortunate was not a choice, it was a way of life simple. I was seven or eight years old when um, my parents started taking me on these visits in a traveling clinic to developing communities around and villages around the city that we lived in called Bareilly. We were packed into this ambulance and would, my parents would provide free medical care to people who couldn't afford it. My job at the age of eight was assistant pharmacist. So I would count all the medicines, put them in an envelope and give it out to patients and I really took my job very seriously very seriously. But the more I went on these expeditions, the more I began to notice the simplest things that distinguished a boy from a girl or a man from a woman. For example, girls were pulled out of school when they hit puberty because they were considered ready for marriage and babies. That's 12 and 13. While boys still enjoyed their childhood. Or basic human rights such as healthcare were denied just because they were women. Let this, let's call this whole experience trigger number one for me. Fast forward a few years and many, many triggers in between. Like a producer director, for example, early on in my career, I must have been about 18 or 19, telling me that if I didn't agree to the ridiculous terms or painfully low salary in his movie, that he would just replace me. Because girls are replaceable in the entertainment business. That was a memorable one. It made me decide to make myself irreplaceable. But I think what really moved the needle for me and ultimately led me to create the Priyanka Chopra Foundation for Health and Education and around the same time partner with UNICEF was an encounter with my housekeeper's daughter. About 12 years ago, I came home from set early one day and she was sitting in my library reading a book and she must have been eight or nine years old and I knew she loved reading. So I asked her, I was like, this is, I mean, it's a weekday, why aren't you in school? And she said, oh, I don't go to school anymore. So I went and asked her mother and I said, you know, why isn't she in school? And her mom said that her family couldn't afford to send her and her brothers to school, so they chose the boys. The reason she would eventually get married and it would be a waste of money. I was completely blown and it shook me to my core. Eventually I decided to cover the cost of her education so that she could continue to learn because education is a basic human right. and a huge necessity, especially today. From that point on, I was determined to make a difference in as many children's lives as I could, in whatever big or small way that I could contribute. There's a really, really beautiful quote that I read recently, and I think it's absolutely appropriate to say, to explain what I'm trying to say today. The hand that rocks the cradle, the procreator, the mother of tomorrow, a woman shapes the destiny of civilization. Such is the tragic irony of fate that a beautiful creation such as a girl child is today one of the gravest concerns facing humanity. Girls have the power to change the world. It is a fact and yet today girls are more likely than boys never to set foot in a classroom despite of all the efforts and progress made over the last two decades. More than, I'm just going to give you a stat, more than 15 million girls of primary school age will never learn how to read or write compared to 10 million boys. Primary school, it's the beginning of our future. Over the last 11 years, I have witnessed firsthand the incredible work that UNICEF does for children around the world, especially victims and survivors of child marriage displacement, war, 
sexual violence. But there is still so much work to do. And for me, that is the fuel to my fire. The reason I am so committed to this cause, and that is where my passion stems from. Because I know that a girl's education not just empowers families, but communities and economies. A result of her education, we all do better. It's just as simple as that. As entertainers and influencers sitting in this room, I feel that it's our social responsibility to be a voice for the voiceless, which is why I applaud each and every woman in this room for being such a badass. <laughs> for using your platform and your voice to contribute to change and for ensuring that there is not even one lost generation as long as we are alive. I'd like to thank Variety and all of you for encouraging me and all of us in this room to keep going and fighting on. Thank you so much. Somewhere someone had told me you have to tell your, um, you know, life story, Ani. So I don't think my life story is good enough for this gathering. So what I'm going to do is, um, it's called She Empowerment. Where do I start? Okay. So generally, um, I've been called, um, you know, the smiling queen <laughs> or something they say out there, but um, is it too loud? Should I? Is it fine? Okay, okay. So yeah, like I was saying, I, I've always been called the smiling queen. And of, yes, of course, I always, always, always keep smiling for all the love I get, for all the appreciation I get from all of you who watch my films. Um, but you know, one of the other reasons why I smile is all of us, I'm pretty sure that all the girls here smile through the sadness, through the loneliness, through the anger, through the frustration. Smile is a superpower, no? Yeah, same thing with me. I keep doing it. And one day I keep thinking, oh, I'll keep smiling till that day where my smile turns into a real one from the heart. But yes, this is a superpower. And that's why women are I think the most pure, I don't know, I don't know how to say, the mother is the purest being in the whole world, is what they say, right? Yeah. I'm so glad to be born a girl. I'm so glad to be born a girl in this generation, having such people protect us with uh, all that they've got. I don't know, I'm just super glad, super proud, and yeah, well, mm, so, let me just start introducing myself. Um, I'm Rashmika. For all those who know me, a big, big hi. And for all those who don't, well, um, I'm an actor in the southern industry and uh, I hope soon you all get to know me as well. That's for my introduction. I don't think I should go on more on that. Um, well, since I was a really small girl, I still remember all that my mother said was you should never let someone else see you angry, see you cry, see you feel any of the negative emotions because apparently that's, that's showing your weakness, right? That's what my mom has always told me and I think that's one of the reasons why I just don't know what else to do now. I, I actually genuinely do not know how to cry. Do you know that? Like, I have to work so hard to actually cry on screen. I cannot do it. And I look like an idiot when I cry on stage. <laughs> I mean, cry on, uh, on screen. I'm sorry. So, yeah, I think um, that is the one thing I can't do. But I don't know. I don't know what to say. Nowadays, I see women doing so many things. Women, you know, accomplishing so many things in different fields. And I feel too little. I feel like, what am I doing? I, do, I don't know. Is it good enough? Is it, is it enough for me to get all of this love and appreciation for, appreciation for something so small that I'm doing? I don't know. I, I don't... I still feel like this is not enough. And I want to do a lot more. 
and well i'm just a girl from a small town in karnataka called grajpet in kodugu district i don't know if you guys are aware of it from there i don't know how my life has happened i don't know at the age of 23 i'm here talking to such a gathering but i'm i'm glad that i am and i don't know if i want to say that i'm proud of myself yet cuz i don't think i'm um, i'm done yet i've just started and i feel like um, i'm in the process of uh, getting myself a huge big loving kingdom that i'm going to create for myself and why i started saying this is if i a girl from kodugu can do this then imagine you guys from hyderabad what you're capable of i think women are capable of doing anything they want in this world and i hope one day all of you make your dreams come true please dream big i'm sorry if the speech is too boring but <laughs> i just want to say dream big do not give a break keep working hard keep working hard it's okay so if someone is laughing at you it's okay if someone is pulling your leg pulling you back down it's okay you just keep working hard you just keep looking up at the sky and reach your goals no matter what anyone else says because if you cannot protect yourself and dream for yourself nobody else can